I have the special pleasure of introducing the introducer of our next speaker. If you wouldn't mind, put your hands together for Justin Meyer. Whoa, I'm waking up, I'm my Sir, thanks for being with us. We go. All right, now we got it on. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Justin Myers. I am the founder of Signs by Veterans. In 2010, I led to the first conviction of piracy in over 200 years, it made international history, obviously United States naval history. And um, I believe, I believe that everybody should have a coach. Um, there's a reason why I'm introducing this man that you guys are going to see next. He has uh, been an instrumental development in my career outside of the military. I've been excellent at everything I've ever done in my life. I was a junior Olympian. I was obviously uh, pretty good in the military, worked uh, with a lot with some special warfare guys. And I got into the business world and realized that I didn't know what I was doing. I was trying to wing it, and uh, I needed help. And uh, the reason I'm here today is good friend of mine passed and he was giving me the opportunity to be here so thank you to Cody and Lauren uh, coach Burt is a former championship coach he's a 13 time author he is a founder of a multi-million dollar coaching program called monster producer which I am a proud member of the network pays for itself I promise you tenfold if you guys get the chance to... in just a minute here is my coach Michael Burt Love it, love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. How many of you have ever had a good coach in your life? Raise your hand. Now, tell me it isn't true that that good coach did three things for you. They had conversations with you that you may or may not want to have, right or wrong. They made you do some things you may or may not want to do, but they helped you become something you didn't think you could become. All right? And that's what I'm going to do for you today. That's what I try to do for all of my monster producers. And I'm going to break down a concept for you because I really believe that what I'm going to talk about today in Million Dollar Follow-Up is that you hear the fortune is in the follow-up. The fortune is in the follow-up. The fortune is in the follow-up. And it is. And you need to be relentless in the follow-up. But sometimes it's not just going the distance. It's the methodology that you use when you follow up. So when I wrote this book, Million Dollar Follow-Up, I wrote it because I watched how pitiful people followed up with me. So so let me just give you some stats. Now, before I give you the stats, I'm going to tell you that 83% of all stats are made up. (laughs) But because I'm a former women's basketball coach, everything I did was on percentages. Everything I did was on, if we do this, this works. If we do this, this works. If we do this, this works. And so here's some stats you need to remember. 80% of sales happen 7 to 15 touches, 80% of the time. How many touches do you think most people go? One, two, three, then they give up, right? Most sales you make should be worth 5.7 referrals over the lifetime of the consumer. But 98% of people never follow up once they do the transaction. And they lose those six referrals at the end of the day. So when you think about this, if you just got better at the 7 to 15 touches, and you got better after the sale, how much business could we get if we just got better at those two things right there? So I was thinking about follow-up and how I can bring it back to you, how I can make it emotional to you. So I was thinking about where did my follow-up come from? Where did this relentless spirit come from? And, and, and early in my life, I asked my mother, and I said, Mom, here's what I want you to do. I want you to, I want you to send me a picture of the first house we lived in. And she sent me that picture of the very first house we lived in, raised by a single mama right here, sitting on the front row. She had me when she was, had me when she was 16 years old. I watched that woman work two and three jobs. I watched her instill in me a prey drive, which is the ability to see something optically and have the guts to go get it physically, okay? And I went back to that very first house, and I wanted to show that house to you. Hey, I wanted to show that house to you if I could figure out. There it is. 
Look at that first house we lived in. And let me tell you something. I stretched it out to make it look bigger. <laughs> it wasn't that big, right? But in that very first house growing up in that small town, that's what, I, that's what I learned. That's what I learned to do. So when you're thinking about this concept of follow-up, and you're thinking about where does this relentless spirit come from? I'm trying, I'm trying, Cody, where's my I'm trying to figure out where to, where, to, where to point the clicker at. When you're thinking about this concept, when you're thinking about this concept of follow-up, here's what I want you to think, okay? The distance you're going with a person, how you follow up is critical, okay? So I'm trying to get to my, my clicker to work here, Cody, and I, po, po, tell me where to point it. I'll point it that way, brother. They're going to bring me another one. I like when things come with batteries included, don't you? There we go. So I went all the way back early days. Where did I start coaching? Point guard, thinking, watching, studying, leading. There's me and mom, 16 years old. Then I went to, then I went to the next stage where I was trying. I'm going to throw the PowerPoint out, guys. It ain't working very good for me, okay? Let me go back and tell it this way. 16 years old, a little league baseball coach picked up the phone and asked me to help him coach a junior pro basketball team. He said, son, I don't know anything about coaching basketball. All I know is about coaching baseball. But will you help me coach this team? And I got dressed up in a suit to go down there and coach junior pro basketball. I looked like a little Pat Riley coaching junior pro basketball. <laughs> but I was so passionate. I was so on fire. I was so excited. I like to tell people I even got ejected from a junior pro basketball game. Not because they liked me, but because they didn't like me, right? And, and at 16 years old, I'm like, son, I'm going to be a coach. This is what I'm going to be. So 18 years old, after coaching those teams... I went to my small elementary school, and this is where I learned to follow up. I went back on day one. I said, I'd like to be the head boys basketball coach of this school. Will you, can I get the job? No. Anytime you get objection, here's what I want you to know. Objection is just opposition of thought. It's a feeling. Objection, when you get objection in life, it is just opposition of thought. That's all it is. So when you're thinking about that, I went back on day two. I went back on day three. I went back on day four. Because no doesn't mean no forever, it just means no when. It just means no today. So I went back and followed up for 14 straight days. And on day number 14, the principal said to me, son, you got the job. Mainly because nobody else wants it. <laughs> so I'm coaching that team, and I remember reading a stat. Most sales happen 7 to 15 touches. 80% of the time. So I went 14 straight days. I get the job. I coach the team. I build my own office. The very first year, we won a state championship. And the principal came to me that year after we won a state championship, and he said, son, you did such a great job coaching this year. We think we would like to pay you. I'm like, great, man. How much are you going to pay me? He said, $199.50 for the year. Now, you know you love doing something if you do it for $199.50, but here's the point about follow-up. How many of you believe that every day with your current customer is an interview for your next customer. How many of you believe that? What's the stat I gave you? For every transaction you do, how many referrals should it be worth? Six. 98% of salespeople never follow up once they make a transaction. So do you want one deal or you want six deals? So I'm coaching that team like I'm in the, in the, in the NBA. I'm coaching every day. And at 19 years old, I get a phone call from this large high school called Riverdale High School in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, which is the second largest high school in Tennessee. And here's what the guy says to me. He said, I've heard about you. Is that a referral? Yes or no? Yeah. Heard about you. I've heard you're this young little whippersnapper that can flat out coach. Would you come down and be one of my assistant coaches? And I'm 19 years old, so I will ask what any good 19-year-old would ask, which is what? I'm like, well, how much are you going to pay me? After all, I'm already making $199.50. <laughs> I'm like, you may not even be able to afford me. <laughs> and the guy says this, and I know Grant's coming on next, and, and here's my first 10X moment. The guy says, we're going to pay you $2,000. And I said, $2,000? Man, I will be there tonight, right? Because <laughs> to go from $199 to $2,000, is that a 10X moment? Yes or no? Okay. Every person in this room is going to have those moments. So I go down there and I'm coaching this team. And here's what I said. There is no job that is beneath me. You want me to carry your bags? You want me to drive the bus? You want me to coach the team? You want me to babysit your kids? It don't matter. Because behind every great number one is a great number two. Do you believe that? Yeah. Behind every great number one is a great number two. So I became a great number two. Because I started to cultivate this dominant focus. This single tangible outcome in my life. 
to become a head coach. And many people will not do that. The average 20 to 30 year old is changing jobs 20 to 37 times. They start and they quit. They start and they quit. They start and they quit. Now let me tell you what I believe. I believe in a long obedience in the same direction. I believe in mastery versus cotton candy. I believe in becoming great. And for most people, how many years does it take to become great? 10. 10,000 hours of practice. Long obedience in the same direction. We don't waver. We stay focused. So a couple years later, I get the head coaching job at Riverdale when I was 22 years old. And I began to do things that no other coach was doing. I was teaching every player the seven habits of highly effective people. I was teaching them the principles of good to great. I was teaching them the five dysfunctions of teams. I was teaching the five disciplines of a learning organization. Imagine your daughter, 14 years old, learning those things. And so so mamas and daddies would drop their daughters off to me, and they all said the same thing. Coach, my daughter's got a lot of potential. Every now and then they said issues, and they were right about that. But they'd say, she just needs something. What do you think they said she needed? Discipline, focus, structure, accountability, a good coach. Now, I want you to remember what I said, but I would always say this to them. I'm going to ask you a hard question that you may not want to answer. Is your daughter watching you reach your potential? Because is it not hypocritical for us to tell our children they have potential if they're not seeing us reach ours? Yes or no? They need to see us dreaming and striving and pushing. So along along the lines, I start doing some pretty interesting things, and that led to us winning championships. There's some picture of our championship team. And here's the good news. If you want to build something that lasts, the beauty of this is our team just kept winning and winning and winning. And legacy, they've now won seven of the last nine state championships. So at 25 years old, people started asking me, what are you doing with those kids? And I said, here's the deal. We have our own little greatness factory. We are manufacturing greatness. We can take people from all walks of life all social economic backgrounds, and we can put them through our system, and we can manufacture greatness. Can your work become a greatness factory, yes or no? Yeah, your work can become a greatness factory. And so around 25 years old, they were saying, what are you doing with those kids? What are you doing with those kids? What are you doing with those kids? And, and I said, I don't have time to tell you. Why don't I just write books on it, and you can read the books, because I'm coaching kids. So businesses, insurance companies, mortgage companies, real estate people begin to call me, and they all said the same thing. We got a lot of good people, and they got a lot of what? No issues. Y'all got to pay attention. They got a lot of issues, coach. Here's what they say. Can't get them to prospect two hours a day. Can't get them to follow up seven to 15 touches. Can't get them to service after the sale. Coach, will you come over and motivate these people? And I remember going and speaking at Dell Computers at 25 years old. And I spoke for an hour, small business division, on what I was teaching the kids on how to win. I get finished, and they said, will you come back? I said, no, I'm not interested. Love coaching kids, have no intention of coaching adults. I'm perfectly fine where I'm at. Will you come back? No, sir, I'm not interested. Thank you for asking. I'm not trying to be rude, but, but, but I got to move on and go coach the kids. He reaches in his pocket, pulls out a check. I open the check. More in an hour than I made in a whole month of coaching High school basketball. You know what I said then? Man, I'll be back every 15 minutes. You need me to come back tonight and motivate the night crew? Now, here's the lesson for you. The lesson is this. There is someone out there who will pay a lot of money for your skill set. I was working 80 hours a week. I worked eight hours a day on Sunday. I would get up and go to church on Sunday morning. And then I would go to my office and work for eight hours, 80 hours a week, making no more than 2,500 bucks a month. And in one hour, I just made more in an hour than I made in a whole month. Every person in this room needs to ask this question. What's the largest check you've ever cashed? And who wrote that check to you? And where did it originate? And why haven't you gone back there to get another one? Because you can fish for bluegill or you can fish for blue marlin. You can wake up every day and you can fish for bluegill or you can fish for blue marlin. And at that time, I began to learn this. So 31 years old, after winning championships, I retired from athletic coaching to coach business people. And here's what I figured out. I want you to remember these things. There's four areas they struggled in. Every business person that I coach struggles in these four areas. Number one, how they explain their services. We teach a six-step framework in how to explain your services that always leads with what you believe, not what you do. People don't care what you do. They care what you believe. 
When two people line up on what they believe, big things happen. Do you agree with that? I believe everybody needs a coach in life. I believe in coming in early and staying late. I believe in a minimum of two hours of outbound prospecting every day. I believe in seven to 15 touches in the follow-up. I believe, I believe in service after the sale to get the 5.7 referrals. And I believe in becoming a person of interest that attracts business to you versus having to chase business. Now, how many of you believe the same things I do? Now, when we believe the same things, what's the probability that you and I are, could do business with each other? So what we do is we teach people how to, how to explain their services because most people don't know how to explain their services in a world-class way. The second thing they don't know is they don't have a selling system. They don't have a selling system. They don't know how to generate leads on a consistent basis. So we teach 14 to 20 strategies every day, outbound calls to, to, to go out and generate leads through a relationship selling system. The third thing, which is what I'm talking about today, is the follow-up. How do you follow up? And there's two problems with most people's follow-up that we're going to talk about. One, they don't go the distance because we live in such a cotton candy world. We want things so fast. We want them to happen right now. And because of that, people want to get a deal and then move on. Get a deal. And I understand. But the percentages tell me this. For every 30 people you talk to, only 4.8 of those people are going to be innovators or early adopters. For every 30 people you talk to, only 4.8 are going to be interested initially. Then there's going to be 34% of those people that need to hear it three to seven times. Then there's going to be 34% of those people that need to hear it seven to 15 times. Then there's going to be five to seven percent of those people that are never going to hear it. You couldn't move in with these people and, and them get it. So when you're thinking about this follow-up concept, here's what I want you thinking about. One, we don't go the distance. We don't go the distance of seven to 15 touches. And the second problem is we don't use the right methodology when we follow up, okay? We don't use the proper methodology. So I want you to think about this. You're feeding your pipeline, and the pipeline is coming through. And, and I start with suspects, not prospects. Because you're not a prospect of mine until we have a conversation and I make up my mind what? That you're not crazy. So we start with suspects. So every day I come into every day that I come in, I got two lists. What you think about this? I got a hit list, and my hit list is new money. New money, new money, new money, new money. Every day. Okay? Then I got a farm club. And the farm club represents all the people who have indicated interest in our services, but we haven't closed them. They're interested, but we haven't closed them, right? So, so from the time we start as a suspect, that's my hit list, to the time we move through the pipeline, that's my farm club, we're going, we could have to go 7 to 15 touches in that prospect. Now, how do most people follow up when they follow up? What do they say? Hey, I'm just doing what? Just following up. Do you have any questions? I had a person actually follow up with me once and said, hey, I woke up thinking about you this morning. Do you know how? It's like, man, that is so creepy for you to say that. You don't want to say, man, I woke up thinking about you today. So, so when I'm noticing this follow-up concept, I'm like, number one, here's what you should never say. I'm just checking in. Here's an insurance example. I had a guy in insurance that believed I was underinsured. He believed I was underinsured. So he called me every Monday morning at 8 a.m. to try to sell me more life insurance with the same pitch. Never text, never, never send a video, same crappy pitch every Monday morning, 8 a.m. So one Monday, I decided that I was going to trick him. I called him at 7.58. <laughs> and I'm like, I know you're about to call me with this real bad insurance pitch that you got. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pitch you on my coaching services because you need to learn how to follow up, right? Same follow up. So here's what people say. Just checking in. Here's the things I never want you to say again. If you want to write these down, write them down. Never say I'm just checking in. Never say I'm just doing my due diligence. Never say I woke up thinking about you. <laughs> never say do you have any questions? Never say, I'm ready to go. Are you ready to go? These are all ways people follow up when they follow up. And if you're going to get, see, here's the, here's the concept. The purpose of the follow-up is what? When we're talking million-dollar follow-up, what's the purpose of the follow-up? 
to bring a person to a decision. But I would even go deeper. It's to rekindle the initial attraction that a person had to you or the product or service. It's to rekindle that initial attraction between you, the product, or the service. It is also to show how you can solve their problem better than anybody else. Because here's the concept. Money changes hands when problems are solved. The bigger the problem, the more money people pay to solve that problem. Everybody understand? So part of the follow-up is to come back at a person to articulate to them what their problem is and how you can solve it better than anybody else. Because when you're selling insurance, you're selling a commodity. What I'm really buying is you. What I'm really buying is your enthusiasm. What I'm really buying is your energy. What I'm really buying is your conviction. So think about it this way. For you to go the distance in this follow-up, there's got to be three things that's got to happen. Number one, you have had to have a major revelation that your product or service can help a person get to a better place in their life. Now, how many of you have had that revelation? It's important because if you ever ever get a phone call that says, I couldn't have done this without you. If you ever get a phone call from a person that says, if you wouldn't have been for you, I don't know what kind of place I would have been in. See, what, what I'm saying is if you've not had a big revelation, which I had at 15, 16 years old, that a good coach can change a person's life. If you hadn't had that revelation, you don't have the conviction. And the conviction is a deep seated belief and confidence that you and your product and service can get another person to a much better place in their life. Without the revelation, I don't have the conviction. And without the conviction, guess what I don't have? I don't take enough action. I don't take enough action. Because if you've had conviction and you believe your product and service can get to a better place, why would you go two touches? Why would you give up when a person tells you no one time? Why would you quit going the distance when a person's, right? So so when you're thinking about this concept, revelation, conviction, action, okay? Now, when you're you're looking at this from a a perspective of how do I bring a person to a buying decision, how many of you have read the book, The Challenger Sale? The Challenger Sale is a great book. I highly recommend it. I use The Challenger Sale in almost everything I do because here's the point. Part of getting a person to a decision is to, is to challenge their thought process because they're thinking one way and you're thinking one way. And you have to actually challenge them during the process. Now, you say challenge. Let me use another word, reframe. Reframe. Because, because remember this, objection is just what? Opposition of thought. That's all objection is. It's opposition of thought. Do you believe that when certainty meets uncertainty, the person that's more certain wins? Yes or no? Okay, well, how do you get certainty? You study the Bible, it talks about in Matthew, the parable of the talents, that the more talent you use, the more talent you're given. That's a demonstrated capacity. When you have a demonstrated capacity to use your talents, guess what? You get more. When you've shown a demonstrated capacity to help enough people, you're going to have this deep conviction. You're going to be able to challenge a person when they give you an objection or excuse or when they give you some type of low-level something. You're going to be able to go back and forth and say, I understand why you think that way, but have you thought about it this way? Would you be open to looking at it like this? Everybody with me? Now, oh, the PowerPoint's working now. Well, it works one slide. Okay, there we go. I'm going to try to get us up to speed here. Now, when you're thinking about this, oh, yeah, somewhere along the way, because of my follow-up, have my wife, and then we had this beautiful girl right here, right? And don't think for a second she ain't in charge, because she is in charge, right? She is totally in charge. Now, I got to come off here. I got to get off with you folks, because I'm feeling disconnected from you. Fair enough? Fair enough. What's up, brother? Was he good today or what? I was watching him over from the hotel. I was like, man, this guy's got some juice, man. I like it. So when you're thinking about this follow-up, if I were to give you objection today, what do most people do when you get objection? What do they do? Especially in the South. For all my South people who live in Tennessee, we want to be liked. We want to be liked so much that when people give us objection, we go, okay, hey, the timing's not right. Hey, it's okay. Call me back when the timing is right. Instead of challenging them and going, saying this, I understand why you think the, talent, the timing isn't right. Is there any other reason outside of you not thinking the timing is right that keep you from moving forward today? If I could show you a way to do this today and why you need to do it, And then I come back with a challenge, and here's what the challenge is. The challenge is this. Can't you and I agree that the timing is never right to take action? 
we create our timing. How many of y'all believe that we create our timing? So see, if you had not had the conviction, you're never going to do that. You're never going to say that. When somebody gives you objection, you know what you're going to do in the follow-up? You're going to quit. You're going to let them control the deal. You're going to let them control the experience. So somewhere along the way, I started to say this. If I could change the way I follow up. See, I watch people follow up and they follow up soft. And I really believe it's because they haven't had that revelation and they don't have conviction. The other day, a person was cold calling me. And halfway through the call, I stopped him because sometimes I like a play, to play around with people who cold call me. <laughs> and here's what I said to him. You don't even believe in what you're selling, do you? You know what he said? You're right. I don't. <laughs> it ain't, see, here's the deal. I got to believe that you believe it. I got to believe that you believe it. And if I don't believe you believe it, you're not getting me off the fence. I'm not moving. I'm not taking action because, because you don't believe it, okay? So let's talk about this 7 to 15 touches. How many people think they got a, a great 7 to 15 touch system? How many people believe in going 7 touches? Right? Yeah, you believe in going 7 touches. So if I ask you this, do you believe 80% of the time it takes 7 touches to get a person off the fence? Yes or no? So if we know that, now I'm going to go back to my high school basketball coaching days. Here's what I knew. If I gave up less than seven turnovers, if I gave up less than 14, second, uh, 14 uh, second shots, if I stopped the other team 21 times in consecutive uh, intervals of three, that kills momentum, by the way, I won 90% of the time. So what do you think we practice every day? What do you think we should be practicing as a business? Training is not something you did one day. It's something you should be doing what? Every day. Every day. We train every day in my office at 830. Every day we train from 8.30. At 9 a.m. every day we make outbound calls for two hours. We then stop and break and dissect what worked and what didn't work. Okay, we then break for lunch. We come back and we try to make X number of calls per day because I know the percentages tell me 16% of people are going to take action, early adopters or innovators. Okay, and so we need the volume. Why do you need the volume? Because you need the volume because you need to get better. You need to learn to sell with conviction. You need to learn to sell through these objections. And you only do that if you work that muscle every day. You follow what I'm saying? So remember this. Training is not something you did, like come to 8% Nation. Training is something you do every day. And if you don't have somebody to do it with you, you can find somebody to do it with you. You train every single day. Now let's think about these seven touches. First touch. If you want to write these down, this is important. First touch. I can't sell you anything until I get your attention. So I'm a big believer, I'm a big, big believer in creating something in the future to push people to. And let me tell you why. When we create something in the future to push people to, it gives all of our people a reason to make outbound calls. So I create retreats, I create events, I create young professionals, I create couples events, I create kids events, I create faith-based events, I create a lot of things in the future which gives us a reason to call out and say, hey, would you like to come to this? Would you like to do this? Oh, no, I can't come to that. It's okay. Would you like to come to this? It's okay. Would you like to do this? It's because if not, I'm just calling on people. I call on people with something to invite them to. So step one is I got to get your attention. Now, if you read my book, Person of Interest, Person of Interest is about how you become so valuable, you're not chasing leads, people are chasing you. Your schedule is booked. People want a piece of you because you are a person that they cannot live without. You're a, you're a must-have versus a nice-to-have. Okay? But for step one, i got to have a reason to call out. Step two, once I do get your attention, here's three things I do. Number one, I build rapport. People ask me all the time how to build rapport. If I could teach you how to be likable, that's the first step. How do you teach another person how to be likable? I remember a, a, a financial advisor I was coaching in Memphis, Tennessee, and he... He wasn't selling anything, and I was going through my checklist to see what the problem was. He had knowledge. He had skill. He had desire. He had confidence. And the CEO called me and said, look, coach, he's not selling anything. What's the problem? And I'm thinking, what is his problem? He looks good. He dresses good. He's got knowledge. He's got skill. He's got desire. He's got confidence. Oh, yeah, nobody likes him. <laughs> Here's what the CEO said. You got to tell him, coach. We're paying you. Tell him he's not likable. So I called him and I said, are you open to some coaching? He said, absolutely. He said, uh, I said, well, here's the deal, man. You got the knowledge. You got the skill. You got the desire. You got the confidence. 
I need you to smile more. I need you to be more open. I need you to genuinely be happy for other people. I need you to meet and greet people and get your head up, make eye contact with people when you come in. Can you do that for me? And he said, oh, yeah, absolutely. And I, after that, I said, I need you to do one more thing for me. He said, what's that? I said, I need you to get out of sales altogether. <laughs> Three weeks later, he didn't do those things. He got fired. Three weeks later because he wasn't likable. So, so what I do when I meet a person, my first step is build rapport, do discovery. I ask questions. How's it going? What prompted you to do this? What do you not like about that? Where are you at? What are your goals? Where would you like to, right? Do discovery. And then I share my explanation of service. Here's what I believe. And here's why I believe it. Because of that belief, here's what it is I do. Here's how I do it different than everybody else on the planet. Here's everybody I'm doing it for. And if I could help you like I've helped all these people, what would stop us from moving forward with each other? Because it seems like, you study any top negotiator in the world, they'll tell you to use this phrase. It seems like you want to do this. You're just stuck on one thing. Am I right about that one thing? It seems like, right? Now, when you explain your services that way, that's my second touch. Now, they're either going to do one or two things at that moment. They're either going to say, I'm interested, or what? They're going to give you objection. What's the objections? Let me think about it. What's the, what are the other objections? Got to talk to my wife. Those poor wives get thrown under the bus more than anybody, don't they? They ain't even talk to their wife at all. They ain't interested in talking to their wife. They just tell you they don't. They got, got to talk to my wife about it. What else do they say? Not interested. What else? How much does it cost? Still thinking. Call me tomorrow. Here's what we say. Got to sleep on it. Got to think about it. Got to talk to my wife about it. Can't afford it. Got to pray about it. I actually heard one person say I got to medicate on it. I'm like, man, that's, uh, I give you credit for being creative. Never had a person tell me they had to medicate on it before they made a decision, but here's the deal. Those are all objection. Objection is what? Opposition of thought. How certain are you in your product or service? Now, I know the percentages. I used to think I would go into an audience like this, and I'd get everybody. I would be disappointed when I went to my booth and I didn't get everybody. But I went into it thinking I was going to get everybody. Because I believe so deeply how much a person needs a coach in their life. What Justin Myers said today. I'll get into a better fre frequency in his life. I believe so deeply in that. I'm so convicted about it. If you and I have a conversation, I believe I can convince you that you need a coach in your life because every major player in the world has a coach. Now, when you give me some pitiful excuse... When we go through the sales cycle, like you need to think about it and sleep on it, and talk about it, pray about it, all those things, the challenger is going to do what? I'm going to come right back at you. And I'm going to go through the whole thing, right? And here's what I may say to you. I can't help you until you commit, but once you commit, I'm not going to let you fail. And why would we wait? And have you ever been on the wrong side of momentum? Because momentum is just energy headed in one direction or another. Or I may say I brought you exactly what you wanted on a silver platter. Right? Now, why wouldn't you take action on it? Seems like you want to do it. I've had salespeople on my team call people, and they say they're not interested. And I say, give me the phone. And I talk to them, and they give that objection, which is just opposition of thought. And I just go right at them. Now, my job is to teach those salespeople how to sell with such a certainty to overcome those objections. Because how many of you put up objection and end up doing something? Only for that something to change your whole life. And at first you didn't want to do it. And you know why you didn't want to do it? There's only two reasons a person doesn't take action in a sales cycle. Fear and uncertainty. Fear is an unpleasant emotion created by a belief that someone or something is going to harm me in the future. Most fear is irrational. Last year at the end of the year, I bought an airplane to fly from place to place because I have a six-year-old daughter at home and I, I didn't want to be away from my daughter and in the last six months we had a night where I was flying back from Memphis Tennessee and we flew through a major major storm and we had incredible turbulence and I had six of my best customers with me if you've ever seen six grown men and women holding hands on a plane praying because we were just getting rocked from place to place to place. And I was like, oh, my gosh, you literally feel like that plane's going to fall out of the sky. 
And we get back to Nashville, Tennessee, and I'm sweating, and I've just had such a traumatic day. And my pilot gets off the plane, and he looks at me, he said, dang, that was fun, wasn't it, coach? <laughs> and I'm like, what is wrong with you? No, it wasn't fun. It was miserable. I mean, I'm, I'm embarrassed for all my customers I brought with me. Here's what he says to me. I know it feels uncomfortable, but it's not unsafe. He said, these planes were engineered to handle turbulence. Planes do not fall out of the sky because of turbulence. So I go home that night and I YouTube, do planes fall out of the sky (laughs) because of turbulence? I buy a book called Cockpit Confidential and I'm reading the book. And every single expert, every single pilot, every single person said the same thing. Although it's uncomfortable, it is not unsafe. Now, I tell you that story for one reason. As soon as I had more information and I knew what the facts were, it took all of my fear away. From that point forward, when I flew and met turbulence, it's okay. It's just normal. It's part of it. Now, in your sales cycle... The reason a person is not taking action with you because there's a lot of money sitting in your farm club right now. If we had to quantify how much money is sitting in your farm club of people who have indicated interest and using your product or service that you haven't closed because you don't have enough certainty, because you haven't given them enough information, it would truly get your attention, yes or no? You know why they haven't taken action? Because you haven't fed them enough information. When I don't have enough information, I'm scared When I do have enough information, I'm no longer scared. So remember this. If I'm in your follow-up and I'm in your farm club, the reason I'm not taking action with you is because you have not given me enough information. It's not my fault. Whose fault is it? Your fault. You know what a big-time monster producer does, the people we coach? Here's what they say. Everything is their fault. They take total ownership of everything. If I call you and you don't answer the phone and you don't call me back, it's not your fault. It's my fault. So here's the voice of mine I'd leave for you. Hey, I tried to get in touch with you. It's my fault for not being interesting enough. Because if I would have brought you a better solution, you would want to do business with me. I take full responsibility that you didn't call me back. I can't tell you how many people call me back with that, after, I, after I leave that voicemail. Because most people don't do that. Here's what they'll say. Well, I couldn't get in touch with them. Tried to follow up, but I couldn't get in touch with them. And I'm like, how hard did you go? Did you, did you send a video? Did you send a text? Did you send an email? Did you send a call? Did you have your best customer call them? Because one of the things I do when I'm tagging people is I have my best customer call on any big-time person that we're trying to sign up for our coaching programs. Everybody understand? What have you done to get their attention? Did you send a pigeon? <laughs> what have you done? Because you haven't done enough, right? So when you're thinking about this concept of follow-up, I'm sitting in there and touch one, i got to get your attention. And the way I get your attention is I have something I try to push you to. Create something in the future, push people to it. Make outbound calls, right? Second step, build, right? Do my rapport, do my discovery, share my explanation of service. What they're going to do is you say, I'm interested. Once they indicate interest, how many touches are we going to go? Seven to 15, minimum. Okay? So step three is I'm going to start the seven-touch process, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to summarize that touch. So you and I met, bless you. You and I met. I did discovery. Shared my explanation of service. You said you're interested. I'm immediately going to go back and I'm going to summarize that meeting between you and I. You said you were going to do this. I showed you I was going to do this. And I'm going to say this. We lose 10% of momentum every day we don't take action. How many people believe that? We lose 10% of momentum every day we don't take action. Maybe more. Maybe more. Maybe more. And have you ever been on the wrong side of momentum? You don't want to be on the wrong side of momentum. Because I would tell you this as a former championship coach, it's all about momentum. It's all about building momentum in in, in selling. It's all about building momentum in energy. It's all about building momentum in conviction. It's all about building momentum in the sales. You don't want deal fatigue. Deal fatigue was I was interested, but you lost my attention. You lost my attention. So step three is I summarize the meeting. And I want you to start thinking of these touches in two ways. Linear, nonlinear. So a nonlinear touch. Think about boxing. Jab, 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 hook. Sweet science to boxing. So I jab with value. I jab with value. I jab with value. Those are nonlinear touches. Everybody see that? Then I come back. Every fourth one, 
boom, with a punch. Have you seen enough to make a decision? Seems like you want to do it, but you're stuck on that one thing. Am I right about that one thing? There's a power in taking action. We can't help you until you commit, but once you commit, what? We're not going to let you fail, right? At that very moment, aren't you building conviction? Isn't selling really just a transfer of conviction, yes or no? So let me ask you this question. Why would you go three or four touches if you had conviction? If you really believe it. Now, you're asking me, Coach, it seems like you're chasing people. Here's the deal. When did I make up my mind that I was going to pursue you? In the first 15 seconds. When I said, I believe everybody needs a coach in life. I believe a good coach can change your life. When I said that, I'm looking at you. How strong is your first belief statement? So that you know within 15 seconds, should I keep going or not? Because many times in that first 15 seconds, I'll make up my mind if I'm going to pursue a person. Would you rather chase somebody for 15 seconds or chase them for 15 months? How many of you have chased something for 15 months only to decide you didn't want it? Is what you're chasing really worth catching? So touch one, I get your attention. Touch two, I come back, right? I do my discovery. Touch three, I summarize the meeting. Touch four, typically here's what I do. I send a non-linear touch. There's two strategies I would use with you. There's three different ways we've done this with somebody else. Let me show you a testimony of five people we worked with. It's a non-linear touch, okay? Touch number five, by this point, if it's a big client, I typically have one of my best customers call them. I'll reach out to my highest paying customers, and I'll say, will you pick up the phone and call this person for me? Now, they're not going to do that. They're not going to do that unless what? Unless you've helped get them to a better place in their life. And if you've helped get them to a better place in their life, then they're going to go and push for you. And when I think about this one, I think about a story in the Bible. It's Jesus, 12 disciples, two women, and a business manager. And they're going from city to city spreading the gospel with the disciples. And then at the very end, there's all these people traveling with Jesus. And at the very end, it says, And many others who were contributing from their own resources to support Jesus and the disciples. I circle that. And here's what I ask. What resources could they contribute? If another person was willing to contribute their resources to support you, why would they do that? Only because you got them to a much better place in their life. You know what other resources they use? Time, food, money, influence. See, when you get another person to a much better place in their life, that's what they'll do for you. They'll contribute their time and their energy and their money and their resources. That's a referral. It's when great people go tell other great people how great you were for them. Because of you, I'm in a better place in my life. Because of you, I've been transformed. Because of you, I had confusion, and now I have total clarity. So so when I get one of my best customers to call a person, that's what they say. You need to do this. You need to take action on this. Right? That's what they say. You need to do this. Now, when I get to touch number six, I come back with a linear. Have you seen enough to make a decision? Right? How many of you have thanked a person for being relentless with you in the follow-up? Only to say, thank you so much for following up with me because I need to do this. You thanked them, right? So touch number six, I may push a little bit harder. Have you seen enough to make a decision? What's stopping you from taking action? And then when I get to touch number seven, here's what I say. Have you noticed how hard I've worked to earn your business? Has anybody else worked this hard? What do you think they say? No. Seems like you want to do it, but you're stuck on one thing. Am I right about that one thing? Because I can't help you to commit. Once you commit, what? I'm not going to let you fail. Now, we've gone seven good touches with you. We've been professional in our follow-up. We know we can help you get to a better place in your life. But we can't do it until you say yes. And once you say yes, we're going to get you there. Now, many times at that point, they'll tell me, you're right, I'm stuck on this one thing. They give me objection. Objection is just what? Opposition of thought. Just a feeling. Feeling of what? Fear. Fear is an unpleasant emotion created by a belief that someone's going to harm me in the future. Fear breeds uncertainty, which is ambivalence, doubt, insecurity. Okay? Vacillation. Now, I've given you the keys on how we overcome that, which is what? How do we overcome those things? We feed people more information. We keep feeding them more information. We keep feeding them more information. Now, 
Let me unpack the challenge for a second. Once you go through the steps of overcoming objection, once you go through the steps, I like to add a step, which is the challenge. So I may challenge you and say this. We can have this talk today, or we can have it six months from today. But you and I both know nothing's going to change between now and then. So why in the world would you stop? A guy the other day said, well, I just need a little bit more time, coach. And I said, here's the deal. Why would you add time to this equation? I can't help you until you commit. Once you commit, I'm not going to let you fail, man. So let's get you started today. Why would we waste November and December to gear you up to start January fresh? Right? He's like, you're right, coach. Many times when you challenge a person directly and you say, look, I understand why you don't want to do this, but you're not thinking this through, then they will take action with you. But, but you won't do that if you don't have enough what? If you don't have enough conviction. So if you're out there selling a product or service that you don't believe in today, I want you to remember this. I got to believe that you believe it. And if I don't believe you believe it, I don't care how many times you call me. I don't care how many times you try to challenge me. I don't care how many pitiful ways you come at me. If I don't believe you believe it, that your product or service can get me to a better place in my life, then it don't matter. Revelation, conviction, action. Now, I'm going to close with this story. I was thinking about why we follow up. There was a time in my life, my wife is over here on the front row, that my wife and I were just dating. And it was rocky. It was incredibly rocky. I had just come come out of a several-year relationship. I had no intention of getting into another relationship at that time. And so we were just literally just dating, casually dating. And my wife came to me, who was then my girlfriend, and said to me, I'm pregnant. And I, I, I was, I mean, I didn't know what to say. I wasn't expecting it. I wasn't ready to get in a long-term relationship. I wasn't ready to be committed. And my response to my wife deeply hurt her. Deeply hurt her feelings. And I understand that. Deeply, deeply hurt our relationship. And she literally, for a period of time, would not have anything to do with me. Nothing. And she's pregnant with our daughter, that beautiful, sweet girl that I showed you. So she's living in her house, and I'm living in my house. We're going days and weeks without talking. And my conscience and my mind kept telling me, follow up, follow up, hang in there, keep fighting. We need, to, we need to be together for this girl. We need to keep pushing. We need to keep pushing. And so I was calling. And I was trying to talk. And I was trying to stay in there. And literally, she wouldn't have anything to do with me. And I said, when we have this young lady, this girl, we, she needs to be in a stable home. She needs to be in a stable place. And I finally convinced my girlfriend at that time to move into my house. And I slept in the pool house. And she slept in the house while she was pregnant with our daughter. And I kept fighting. And I kept saying, I'm going to hang in there and let's keep going. And then we have our daughter. And we start to get closer. And we start to get closer. And we start to get closer. And it had nothing to do with her the whole time. It had everything to do with my inability to commit to something. My inability to see something through to its conclusion. My inability had nothing to do with her. And then as we begin to hold that girl in our hands and we begin to spend time with each other and we begin to do this, I knew this was the woman that God placed in my life. This is the woman I'm supposed to be married to. This is the person that I'm supposed to be there with. Now fast forward seven or eight years today, I would tell you my greatest follow-up, my greatest follow-up of my life was that right there, getting her. Now, I say that to you for one reason. When I look at my little girl and I see that spunk and that fire and that energy, and when I see, when I see that little mini me, that little mini Coach Bert, <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I love that. And when I see that, that's why I follow up. Because I know that that's what happens when you follow up. That's the kind of conviction you got to have to follow up. Not just in your personal life but in your business life. And when you have that kind of conviction, 
There is no such thing as rejection. Some will want what you have. Some will not want what you have. So what? We're just going to keep on moving. There is no such thing as rejection. And you need to tell yourself that. Some will want what you have. Some will not want what you have. So what? That's never going to stop us from sharing the message. Because 16% of those people are going to be in. You follow what I'm saying? 16% of those people are going to be in. So, so let me close with this. How much conviction do you have? And if you're sitting in the audience today and you, you're sensing that you ain't had enough conviction and you don't believe or you need to get your swag back or you need to get back to a dynamic state where people are attracted to you or you came for this reason so you could get something, you could borrow some confidence from somebody else until you got your own, until you have that confidence to keep following up because I keep coming back, it's certainty, man. It's certainty that when I look in your eyes, I know I can get you to a better place. You know why? Because the demonstrated capacity of getting so many people to a better place in their life. That's why we know it works. Now, when we get finished today, I want to tell you this. I've got a new app out called Monster Producer. Okay? So, so I want you to pull your phone out right now. This is completely free. I want you to pull your phone out right now and look under Monster Producer. Some of you already got the app. It's free to you. You get videos from me. It's got all my retreats. You guys, did you guys enjoy Tim's story yesterday? So April 4th through the 7th of next year, Tim Story and I are doing a retreat together. So you get me and Tim Story in Vero Beach, Florida for three days. And I'm talking up close and personal. Us coaching you every day for two or three days, me and Story. We're working on doing other retreats with big-time people. Tim Grover, if you know him who wrote Relentless. Okay, you're going to see me do retreats with all these big-time people. And it's two or three days of me and you locking up. Okay, But I want to tell you this. Some of you here are going to be interested in coaching. That app has got everything in there. I'm going to be right over here at the end, okay? And we're going to talk about everything. We can talk about retreats. We can talk about coaching in Monster Producer. We can talk about the, the, anything that we have as far as helping you get to a higher frequency. Because today there's something in there for you to get my online academy for a one-time price for like $6.97 in that app, okay? And that means it's updated weekly. You can get coached by me every single day, and I guarantee you I can get you I can get you a lot more deals. My goal is a 43% increase in one year. That's my goal for every single person that I coach. If they do what we're teaching them to do. So download the app. Come say hi to me over here. And uh, here's what I want to say. You showed up. We're growing up. And we're going to deliver. Fair enough. God bless you. Everybody needs a coach. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Coach Bird. We appreciate you. Thanks for being with us, sir. Thank you. I love that.